five years after Amtrak took over operation of passenger services on the Northeast Corridor, in 1976, Congress authorized an overhaul of the Northeast Corridor between Washington and Boston. The program was called the Northeast Corridor Improvement Project. This included safety improvements, modernization of the signaling system, and new centralized electrification and traffic control centers. This upgrade also allowed more trains to run faster and closer together, and would prove critical for the latter stage of high-speed rail operation on the Northeast Corridor. The Northeast Corridor Improvement Project included the creation of the AEM-7, which to this day has been one of Amtrak's most reliable locomotives. And with the introduction of the AEM-7, the Northeast Corridor Improvement Project set travel time goals between New York and Washington at 2 hours and 40 minutes, and between Boston and New York at 3 hours and 40 minutes. Travel times that still haven't been met today. Welcome to the truth about the Acela, episode number 1. In this series, we'll explore the Acela route, learn about the future of the Acela, what we can learn from the Acela, and most importantly, why Amtrak's flagship service is having difficulties reaching goals set half a century ago. Please exit to the rear door. Doors open. In 1992, Congress passed the Amtrak Authorization and Development Act requiring Amtrak to establish high-speed rail service between Boston and New York City. The goal was to reduce the travel time between these two cities from four and a half hours to three hours. A major part of this project was electrifying the entire Northeast Corridor so that high-speed trains can run from Boston to Washington, D.C. This meant that the section from New Haven to Boston would have to be electrified. Before Amtrak would pour hundreds of millions of dollars into electrifying the corridor, Amtrak leased two high-speed train sets from Europe. A Swedish X2000 and a German ICE-1 were the two train sets chosen by Amtrak to conduct tests on the Northeast Corridor. For Amtrak, the goal was to test the southern section of the Northeast Corridor from Washington DC to New Haven to see how much work would be needed in order to make high-speed trains viable on the section that is already electrified. For ABB, the manufacturer of the X2000, and Siemens, the manufacturer of the ICE-1, their goal was to hopefully get a contract to have their high-speed train models exported to the United States for this new proposed high-speed rail service under Amtrak. Amtrak didn't lease these models in order to begin the procurement process. Amtrak Amtrak wouldn't even start the bidding process until two years later. The purpose of these train sets was to analyze how much work needed to be done on the existing corridor. And not just physical improvements to the corridor, but improvements to customer service and service reliability. Other than that, this was mostly a publicity stunt by Amtrak in order to create some enthusiasm about high-speed rail in America. Now, the reason that Amtrak specifically chose these train sets is because both of these train sets are used on conventional rail lines in Europe. Therefore, these train sets were more appealing to Amtrak than the Shinkansen of Japan or the TGV of France. But it should be noted that Amtrak already knew that there wasn't an off-the-shelf high-speed rail train set that could be used on the Northeast Corridor. This means that whatever manufacturer that wins the bid to build the high-speed train set would need to come up with something completely new for the American market. The X2000 is a Swedish electric tilting train that began service on the 283-mile route between Stockholm and Gothenburg in 1990. Upon its introduction, the train cut the four-and-a-half-hour-long journey between the two cities into just three hours. If you remember, these time reductions are similar to the time reductions that Amtrak was proposing for their high-speed service. On top of that, Sweden, just like the US, has a lot of curves in their railway lines, and the country wasn't prepared yet in investing in new high-speed rail lines solely for passenger service. This means that they needed a tilting train set in order to provide a significant advantage over the existing passenger rail services. Tilting trains can run around short radius curves at up to 15% faster than non-tilting trains, all while maintaining passenger comfort. So it's safe to say that when you're building high-speed rail and you have a lot of tight curves on your right-of-way, a tilting train set probably makes the most sense. <clears throat> The IC-1 was the first commercial produced German high-speed train set and began service a year after the X-2000 in 1991. Upon its introduction, 
These trains ran on a mix of high speed and conventional rail lines in Germany, which again was the main reason why it was chosen for the tests on the Northeast Corridor. In normal service, these train sets consist of two power cars and up to 14 intermediate cars. However, it should be noted that only two power cars and six intermediate cars were sent to America. The six intermediate cars consist of one first class car, where half of the train's seating configuration was in the two plus one arrangement, and the other half comprised of three personal compartments with five seats each and had a capacity of 48 passengers. Three second class cars that were also divided into two main areas, one part with two toilets and four passenger compartments with six seats each, and the other part fitted into rows in a 2-2 seating arrangement with six tables between them and capacity for 66 passengers in each car. One restaurant car, which includes a dining area with eight tables and 24 seats in a 2 plus 1 configuration. And last but not least, a service car which has two wheelchair spaces, a wheelchair accessible toilet that has a changing table, wider doors for more accessibility, a phone booth because it's the 90s, a conference room with a large table, four freely movable chairs, an electronic typewriter, a fax machine, a telephone, and power sockets. Power sockets might not seem that big of a deal, but again, it's the 90s. The rest of the seats have a similar seating layout as the second class cars, but there was also a compartment and a restroom for the employees of the restaurant car. The capacity of the car is 45 passengers. This makes for a total capacity of 291 passengers, excluding the restaurant car. The X2000 consists of a power car, four or five intermediate cars, and one cab car. It should be noted that only four intermediate cars were sent to America. The intermediate cars consist of four first class coaches and a bistro car in the middle of the consist. The train has 4,370 horsepower. In testing, the train reached a top speed of 171 miles per hour. This was done by replacing the cab car with a secondary power car, doubling its horsepower. But in regular service with only one power car, the train is relegated to 125 miles per hour. However, in operations with Amtrak, the train was allowed to run at 135 miles per hour. It should be noted that both train sets kept their original paint schemes while in service with Amtrak. The only difference in the paint scheme would be the words Amtrak applied on the trains. The Swedish X2000 train sets are made with stainless steel, while the German ICE train sets are made with aluminum silicone alloy. Unfortunately for Amtrak, the ICE-1 train sets did not come with tilting technology, but with two power cars, the ICE absolutely dwarfs the X2000 in horsepower, with the power output of 12,874 horsepower. This also means that the train set had very fast acceleration and could reach a top speed of 175 miles per hour, though these trains were relegated to slower speeds as well. The X2000 was placed into Metroliner service from February until May of 1993, and then from August to September of 1993. ICE service along the corridor didn't start till April. Both train sets would be applauded by passengers for their smooth ride and comfortability. However, in the end of the day, Amtrak will come out on top as the main winner. As their Metroliner tests and their goals in getting Americans enthusiastic in high-speed rail were both successful. Unfortunately for the manufacturers, both ABB and Siemens would have their trains sent back without any confirmed orders from Amtrak. It wouldn't be until 20 years later that Siemens would get orders for equipment on the Northeast Corridor. And one last thing before I end things out, the poll for the next Truth About High Speed Rail series is live. It's in my community tab right now. If you haven't seen it or heard about it already, here are your four options. Brightline West, Texas Central, Amtrak Midwest Wolverine Service, and Amtrak's Northeast Regional. The length of these series vary depending on how large the projects actually are. So yeah, whatever project you choose might be the project that we spend the next five months talking about. With that being said, if I earned your like and subscription, I love you. And if you made it this far in the video, thanks for watching.